I am H.F. Williamson. I am interviewing Malcolm G. Davis for the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress American Folk Life Center. We are at Studio X, Campbell Hall in Urbana, Illinois. Henry Radcliffe is the Director of Lighting, Sound, and Camera. Good morning, Malcolm. Well, How are you? Good morning. Oh, I'm pretty good for an older guy. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Why don't you tell us about your background and what you were doing before you went in the service? Well, I was born in Urbana, Illinois, on California Street. That before they did it in hospitals, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my. My father was a grocer downtown Urbana, crossing the Busey Bank, and uh, I uh, graduated from Urbana High School in 1936. And right then, uh, a good friend of mine, my father was a foreman at the binder at the University Press. And uh, I got on as an apprentice there and served my apprenticeship. And just when I finished the four years, was I was drafted and had to go in the Army, had to go to Chicago to sign in by train. And uh, I went to Camp Blanding in Stark, Florida for training. A lot of sandy place there. I, I didn't know at the time, but that was preparing me for walking in the deep snow over in <laughs> <laughs> Europe. Is this the infantry that you were being trained in? Pardon? What branch were you trained in? The infantry? In infantry. And I ended up in the 30th Division, 119th. Infantry and Company D, and that was a machine gun company. Okay. <laughs> and uh, when I got up, well, I got up to the front line on Christmas Eve and dug my first sop foxhole. What year was this? <laughs> in 1944, in December 24th. And uh, so. Had you gone directly from Florida to the European theater? They took yeah, well, well, I went to New York and, and got on a boat and uh, landed in, in England. I, I think I went out from Liverpool. I can't remember the other city I went in, but if, at that time, it, the, all the lights were out and everything for Kind of the war, so. Were you given any training once you arrived in France before you went up and dug that first foxhole? No. Oh my gosh. He went right in. I landed at La Havre, and I remember there's a we had our all our uh, duffel bags. They were pretty heavy. And I had to carry that. They marched us up a hill or a brick brick road. I remember that, and then I got into the 30th Division, and uh, I got there. This they, they stopped the Germans in the Battle of Bulge, and uh, we pu pushed them back, and uh, I. Uh, so you were part of the the people they were bringing in quickly to help stop the German Battle yeah. of Bulge advance. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So uh, uh, let's see where. So you dug your first foxhole on Christmas Eve, and then were you moving forward after that? Yeah, and then we moved in the forty and eight train. Oh forty men and eight horses. <laughs> Little box cars and and uh, see when I got 
with my uh, company, I, let's see, well. How close to the front lines could the trains go? Not very close, yeah. but they, they had the uh, four before trucks and jeeps and a thing happened that was kind of interesting. They, I, when I got with my outfit, I was riding behind a jeep on a trailer. Mm -hmm. And the jeep driver got a little intoxicated and he went in the ditch and the trailer flipped over. And, and my buddy and me were sitting on it, but I jumped. But he got his legs broke or something. I never saw him again. So that was, I was just pure lucky, I guess, but <laughs> I quit thinking they'd jump off of it. So, uh, were you, were you continually moving or did you have to stop and dig foxholes at times when the Germans fought back or how was that going? Oh, uh, No, well, the foxhole was before that, yeah. but uh, uh, we, I guess we were chasing them out or something, because I remember going across the field, we were under fire, and I had a pocket Bible in my pocket here, and I got a piece of shrapnel that hit that Bible, put a dent in it. Metal is metal covers on it. Then, uh, so the Bible saved you from a serious wound. Well, I, it might have been something, I don't know. Well, that's nice. Yeah, <laughs> I was thankful for that. But then we got up and across the Roar River, and that was a river about. Not a big river, but it was one of the main rivers. And when it went on and on, on, on to uh, the Rhine River, and uh, I remember we had we were walking then, spread out, and uh, uh, I don't know. I, were you within range of the German? Yeah, we, we heard. We heard. Then we got into into the Black Forest. Oh. And before uh, that, did, when you crossed the Rhine, were you on bridges, or did they have to ferry you across the Rhine? Were all the bridges still intact? Oh, one bridge. We crossed the river, and the bottom I was out, and it was a steel bridge with a flat. It sloped up and then crossed and sloped down. Had to walk on them, and I didn't know that I would fall off or not. Oh my! You had to go on the girders. <laughs> you had to keep your balance. Okay. <laughs> so. Uh, so you're across the Rhine and you're in German country, in German yeah. territory, Germany. And I got pictures of where we met the Russians. Oh my God. We hooked up there, and they come one way, and we come another, and we cleaned out the Germans, and the Russians were glad to see us, we were glad to see them. <laughs> so there was a friendly meeting? Yeah, yeah. I got a picture of them. Oh, that's nice. And uh, so. Uh, was this pretty near the end of the European War by now? Yeah, I, I see. I, So I got in one house was Herman Goring's headquarters, oh. and I got some German money there out of it. <laughs> 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 and uh, oh, I got I got a helmet too, a, a leather helmet they wore German. Right. 
And uh, what city was this? Do you remember where his headquarters was located? No, I. We went through towns pretty quick. And How did you ever have a chance to interact with the local German citizens, the population? Yeah, one one town. They were all the houses were right on the street, pretty close. I mean, but they were. I remember people in the windows when we went through and cheering for us, oh. <laughs> waving and cheering. And uh, so when we got through, we come out. Camp Lucky Strike was the camp that I was through. There were several on the coast. These were where you were stationed once the war ended and they were waiting to see what to do next? No, we just checked through there and then got on the boat to come back home. Yeah, the European theater was over. In yeah, okay. but then when we were halfway home on that boat, well, that's when the Japan surrendered. Otherwise, the, would you have been going to Japan? We were scheduled to, yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, well, I was one of the outfits that was handpicked to go there. And the 30th Division got the presidential citation for what we did where we were at then. But then we come back to Boston, I think it was, mm -hmm. and they shipped us to Chicago by train and then train down to uh, Atlanta, I think. No, to Chicago, and we got the discharge there, I think. I see. Did your parents We didn't know? get a discharge. We, we got a 45-day leave because oh. they didn't know what they were going to do with us. And, uh, Got a 30 day leave first, but then they added 15 days to it. I got that uh, notice I got through the mail when I was home. So. Did your parents know you were coming home at that point? Did you be able to call them or write them? Yeah, I think they knew. Okay. I they can't must have been excited, yeah. But, uh, so when the 45 days is up, why? Well, I got discharged. Okay. And so how, once the war ended in Europe, how long did you have to stay in Camp Lucky Strike? Was it pretty quick? Yeah, okay. I don't remember. They wanted you home for the to go to Japan. Japan. But, uh, I don't remember too much about that. It was just rushing to here and sign yeah. that and sign that and <laughs> everything. So. Uh, well, some of your fellow troops were left in Europe and they stayed there a lot longer before they were discharged. So yeah, you got I don't, home more quickly, yeah. I don't remember about that. We didn't didn't know anything Some about the other it. divisions. <laughs> but there was it was the thirtieth division, hundred and nineteenth infantry and I was in company D. What was the most difficult or different thing about getting out of the military and coming back to civilian life? Well, I was a printer, and I was an apprentice printer right. at the University Press. And then I was a journeyman then. So you were able to get back with the University yeah, Press? Yeah, I got back in, okay. all right. And I stayed there for 35 years. Oh, gosh. And retired, and then I, Got a job uh, in the grocery store, Shrimp's Grocery at 6th and John Street in Champaign. Right. And uh, I spent 22 years there part time. Oh my gosh. But I got my Social Security built on that when I was the university. They didn't have Social Security, right. but I got a university pension and Social Security. So that worked out. Well, what are some of the other memories of your period in the war that you think are most striking? The most what? 
are most striking to you or that come back most vividly when you think back on that period in Europe? Well, the, the Black Forest was pretty tough with all that snow. And I, we were beside of the road that went through there. And they was uh, bringing some uh, German prisoners through there. And uh, we said to ourselves, oh, I bet they don't live long. Because oh. those Germans had killed a lot of our prisoners. And uh, that could be that they, they didn't make it. I don't know. <laughs> but this was, you were advancing on foot through the forest to get to cover the ground? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Oh, wow. But that, of course, that accident uh, where I was riding the Jeep was just pure luck that I did what I did. Right. <laughs> Quick thinking. So, I don't know much more. That's understandable, yeah. So what, what part of your basic training did you think was the most valuable when you got over to Europe that really helped you survive and do well? Did they train you well in Florida? Well, uh, I never, I had a carbine, carbine Right. Instead of a rifle. Did you like that better than the M1? Yeah, it was, it was lighter. Okay. It fired I, I never had to fire it. Oh. Okay. <laughs> but how I, long? How long was the training? The basic training in Florida? How many weeks? Uh, from J June to December. Okay. In '44. I think I've got some papers there that spell that out. So they trained you well then? Pardon? They trained you a long time and I hope they trained yeah. you well, yes. I remember one time down there there was a hurricane warning. Oh. And we all had to go in a certain building. But it never got that far in, but they were taking precautions. Were every, was everyone at that post in Florida going to Europe? That was, as far as you They know? were going to different places. Oh, okay. And uh, I went, in the unit I went into, and when I got to Europe, there was uh, 10 or 15. And I was the only one that made it through. Really? They got sick or killed or something. You got a lot of trench foot when your mm -hmm. boots get right. full of snow. And they, I was lucky I didn't didn't get it. <laughs> I don't know. Did you get to uh, see any of the the leaders of the armies in those times, or the the generals, or the the others when you were a soldier? We were under, in Patton's army. Okay. I think I saw him once. Ah. Oh, another thing. My brother-in-law was a major. And he was over there. And his, his job to coordinate the ground and the air forces. Mm -hmm. And he knew where I was. And he sent for me back to headquarters and uh, I, I stayed overnight, but I had to sleep on a, in the basement, it's a brick building, uh, on a bed of sugar beets. <laughs> <laughs> Just because there were no beds or because you were- that, No, there, was, there wasn't much place. Okay. That, of course, the officer and everything was upstairs, but I just picked that and I was tired and everything and just okay. laid down on those sugar beets. And it's just, <laughs> so. Uh, when you were in the field, were you sleeping outdoors all the time? 
Yeah. 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 So that was yeah. being indoors was a a break from from the outdoor sleeping. Yeah. What rank were you when you completed your service? Private first class. All right. And uh, when I was visiting uh, my brother-in-law, I got some ice cream there. Oh. We never had that. <laughs> So there was, my wife had three brothers and me. We all were in the service. One was a bombardier over Italy and a major. Uh, and, uh, and the other one, the oldest brother, was a truck driver taking supplies to the front and back and back and back. So we all got out oh, good. on the arms. So is there anything else you'd like to tell about your experiences? Well, I don't. When I went to Chicago to register, the officer there was uh, He owned the all supply store. Grogards or Grogards. Oh. He was he was uh, I think the row part. I can't remember the last <laughs> name now, <laughs> but but uh, that was something that. So he was from Urbana and Champaign yeah, too. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> So. Well, thank you. Yeah. We have been interviewing Malcolm G. Davis on Tuesday, September 25th, 2007. It has been a pleasure to have a chance to talk to you. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Hook <laughs> uh, it up so we get the, the microphone off. Is that okay, Henry? That's fine. Okay. <laughs>